in this because at the time um, of the booking, nobody made any objections. Okay, so um, if you look down at the bottom corner, all right, of um, the bottom right hand corner, you'll see there's a hashtag there. And um, please use that and um, tweet, yeah, about this webinar. Um, so before we actually start it, I'd like to just give a little introduction to the group's activities. And what we do is we share best practices via conferences, Twitter, webinars, surveys, and our digital capability community forum. And um, here we go. Here's an example of a conference. There's one coming up very soon. It's actually on the 15th and the 16th of May. And it's our spotlight on digital capabilities, number four. And it's from theory to action. And it's going to be held at the Radcliffe Conference Centre in Warwick. And, um, you know, so if you are actually interested in um, going along, then um, what I will do, if I can just paste this in, all right, um, there you go. I'll put the link into the chat for you there. All right, so what we also do are 60-minute tech talks. And um, the next one that's coming up will be on the 1st of May. And this one's going to be all about digital leadership development at the University of Leicester. So we're going to hear from Ross Parry and Nevin Moldina. And um, they're going to discuss how they've worked with HR to incorporate um, digital, to incorporate digital into the leadership development program. So, um, we are always looking for people to share their experiences. This is a platform for the community. And so if you have a project or if you have something that you want to share with the rest of the community, just give me an email. Drop an email to me. And maybe we can uh, we can set up a, a, a date. OK, so um, I'm going to move on. Ah, so we're going to, if I just go back there, I think there was a link I should have actually thrown in there because most of these. Um, webinars are actually recorded and you can find them actually on YouTube, the USISA website, but you can also find them in our um, digital community, our digital capable community. So there you go, there's the link for that one there. All right, so I'm just going to move on and this is the forum itself. Okay, so um, please join. If you've not joined already, um, there's the address there for you to join. Um, and we have discussions going on there. Um, you have people that are actually, um, you know, putting their blogs on there about topics, about technology. Um, so it's quite interesting. So there's a link for that one. And just going to move on. And we also conduct surveys as well. And the last survey that we did was 2017. It was a digital capabilities survey. The report is actually on the website. And um, we are actually in the planning for the next one. OK, so some of the questions that we're going to cover today are actually um, you know, from this report, the 2017 one. So if you want to have a look at the report and recommendations, then um, there's a link for that as well. OK, so um, swiftly moving on, this is what you're here for. You want to know about the approaches to embedding digital capabilities for staff. And our two guests that we have um, is Karen Barton. She's the Director of Learning and Teaching at, Uni at the University of Hertfordshire. And then you've got Dr. Elaine Swift. She's going to follow shortly. And um, she's a Digital Practice Manager um, that doesn't say organizational, does it? But that's what she does, organizational <laughs> development at Nottingham Trent University. So what I would like to do is to pass over to um, Karen. So Karen, could you please take over the slides for me? Yes, I can. Thanks very much, Lorraine. Wonderful. Um, I think, I hope you can all hear me. Yes, and, I can. Uh, good. Thanks, Lorraine. And uh, I, I'll talk for I think about 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to race through a few slides uh, in 10 minutes so that others have, have uh, plenty of time to speak. Um, I'm happy if, if you've got questions, if you want to post them in the chat. I'll either answer them as they come up because they, they'll be relevant and, um, or, or I'll 
uh, answer them at the end of the presentation if if uh, we need to, and I haven't covered them already as part of the presentation, if that's okay. So I'm just going to talk to you about our journey, I suppose, because um, at University of Hertfordshire, I'm sure it's like other uh, institutions uh, and most of you um, joining in today in the webinar, we are on a journey towards trying to develop digital capabilities for staff across the institution. And um, this is really just telling you where we are, how we got to where we are and, and where we hope to go uh, next. We um, had a review, as, as I'm sure lots of people do have from time to time, of our Office of the Chief Information Officer, as it was called a couple of years ago. And one of the recommendations from that review was that we uh, developed digital capability profiles for our staff um, as part of the outcomes of that review, uh, try and assess our staff skill levels and identify requirements for digital capabilities um, across the institution. And then having having done that, uh, look to, de to de deliver and develop our digital capability training and development for staff uh, and for students. So our first, uh, first step in doing that was to set up a, 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 a scoping group, really a steering group, about a year ago. And it was drawn from staff and students from across the institution. And we pulled in staff from... Uh, academic schools, from the professional uh, staff areas across the, the university, from our staff development areas, the traditional staff development areas from um, human resources, from our learning and teaching information uh, innovation centre uh, and, and other areas that are responsible for staff development and students. And really what we did initially was, as I think a number of people have done, is, is look at the JISC uh, capabilities discovery tool and participated in that pilot uh, as one of the institutional case studies. Um, we, we pulled together uh, an online community of staff who were involved in that through various channels that we normally use for communications and so on. And we um, encourage staff to take part in, in that, uh, using that discovery tool as a way to uh, assess where we were as an institution with our digital capabilities, but also to get that conversation going about what digital capabilities meant for us within the university and how we would then try to move on from having assessed staff's capabilities, moving on to developing those in future. Um, it, the pilot, as you can see, I'm not going to go into detail. For us, the results um, were uh, we had about four, we had 46 academics, 71 professional staff and 39 who had identified themselves as managers taking part in the pilot from, again, across the, 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 the range of schools and professional uh, units within the institution. And, and for us, we, we got some insights into where the, the gaps were and where the main areas for development where currently, and you'll see for academics, those were around digital productivity, identity management and well-being. For, for the professional um, staff, it was more around digital collaboration, creation and also digital teaching. That was interesting in itself, but really I think the main thing for us was it, beyond giving us just a snapshot view of proficiencies and gaps, it really generated the discussion around the language of digital capabilities, what it meant to different people, and um, started getting us to think about what we currently had in the way of development for staff around uh, those skills and where we were looking to, to fill gaps that we current, currently weren't um, producing. So it was, it was about winning hearts and minds to some extent, but also giving us some steer as to where we needed to, to develop resources and other forms of supporting staff. At the same time, and this is perhaps where the, where the interesting part for me comes at working in, in learning and teaching uh, innovation center we were remodeling our own cpd framework for academic staff so we had um pulled together our two-year uh, training program for it's a very small slide i know the print's very small but you can zoom into it maybe uh, and see some detail in there we were looking at what we provided for staff over the first two years with us uh, as new members of academic staff, whether they were brand new to teaching or whether they'd come from another institution and, and were um, uh, already experienced in teaching but needing developed and, and inducted into the institution at the University of Hertfordshire. And also what we were providing for staff who were longer term with us, three years plus and six years plus um, in, in, 
in the institution. And we were looking at how we developed CPD and, and staff development across those different stages of the academic lifestyle. And we were aware that quite a lot of, uh, in that lifestyle, we were embedding a lot of digital capabilities. Uh, and we were, were looking at just mapping that out at the same time as we were doing this, um, the digital capabilities uh, toolkit. We had produced these learning landscapes, as we call them, for different for, for staff at different stages of their life, as well as part of our CPD framework, um, showing that learning takes place in all sorts of different ways. Um, we, we were calling this um, an entitlement model, really, that staff are all entitled to training. It's not just required to uh, have CPD in training, but that it's something that we think is, is, a, is one of the advantages of working in the institution is the level of support that we give and the level of support that you get from various uh, sources, from colleagues, from, from doing your job, from the literature and from the CPD that we provide. So we were looking at trying to take that kind of work and what we were doing with our CPD frameworks and, and the, also the digital capabilities framework and thinking about how we could merge these two things together uh, into one, one kind of landscape. So that's really where we are. We've got this, we're at this point where we have, um, we've, we've used the toolkit, we have created our framework and we are now at the point, if we look at the right hand column of this slide, where we are looking at how we can map the digital capability frameworks and uh, uh, the elements of that framework to our academic CPD framework uh, and to promote where we are currently providing opportunities uh, in terms of digital capabilities and identifying where there are gaps and what sorts of training, um, support, advice and so on that we might offer to fill those gaps. The second stage of that really is extending what we've done for the CPD, uh, for the academic framework, into um, a blueprint for staff in professional areas. So exploring, taking that framework that we have for academic staff, using that as a blueprint for staff in our other professional services areas. And then our third phase of um, phase two of our programme is to look at uh, our students' digital capabilities using the, the digital st uh, student tracker and uh, look at how we can support our students' digital capabilities going forward. We now have a, a fairly um, representative or a very representative um, group who are, uh, I'm just going to go back, sorry, who are uh, again drawn from across the whole of the uni uh, of the university from different areas in the university and we've got joint senior sponsorship um at our at, at senior lev level our deputy vice chancellor as chair of our library and computing services board sponsors the project along with our secretary and registrar as chair of our people board and between them if you look if you like there's a there's a technical aspect to this and then there's the people aspect that we're trying to bring together we are tying it very much into our uh, CPD uh, process, our appraisals and reviews um, from, from individuals and from line managers coming together to agree CPD actions uh, and, and various triggers, traditional triggers being our induction and probation uh, stages, the, the general appraisal review, our annual programme team reviews and so on and, and the various other annual cycles around um, NSS action planning and so on that would trigger um, a, a, a something to us that, that would, would flag up the need for uh, digital capability development as part of our CPD framework. And we're trying to map that, as I said, against our learning landscapes about the different ways in which you might acquire those digital capability skills, not necessarily just through attending workshops, but through other activities, uh, through other colleagues and so on. And on this slide, I've got a, a note of, of all the different um, academic schools, professional support units who are engaging in this pilot uh, to take our CPD framework, the digital capabilities framework, engage in that mapping exercise and that self-assessment and then look at how we can help deliver um, digital capabilities through that CPD framework blueprint. Um, we are, we've got our three main areas where we have 
teams who support that are Learning and Teaching Innovation Centre, which is the team I hold up, our People Development and Change team and our Human Resources team, as well as our Library and Computing Services team, who, who also do, who deliver a lot on the on the uh, digital capabilities front. And that's really what we where we see we are now is this partnership approach and and and. Um, We've got a whole bunch of people, and from the slide that I've put up, we've got our, as I said, Library Computing Services, our Learning Teaching Innovation Centre. We have within uh, our schools, we have champions who work with staff in terms of um, introducing the use of the VLE and how to how to develop uh, learning and teaching resources and so on for students. We have student technology mentors, and we have our HR people development team. All of all of that group really looking at delivering different parts of that digital capabilities framework, either in one-to-one in -one sessions, through um, online courses that we've developed ourselves on our VLE, through external resources like lynda.com and so on that we subscribe to. And that's where we're looking at heading next, is really trying to map from the CPD framework, the digital capabilities, to the type of support uh, that we can provide and, and, and give that that landscape and that pathway for all of our staff to move forward on. That okay, wonderful. and I hope that was 10 minutes roughly. Oh, <laughs> yeah, roughly. Thank you so much, Karen, for sharing that with us. I'm going to move swiftly on to yeah. um, Elaine. So, Elaine, can you take over as a presenter? And, yes. Um, have you got the slides? And yeah. away you go. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so, um, it's good to talk to everybody today and I was just going to present um, a very few number of slides just about digital capability at NTU. And similar to um, Karen, we've definitely been on a journey and um, Al started a reasonable amount of time ago when actually with the formation of the team that I now lead, it came together through a reorganisation which prompted um, some rethinking about how we looked um, at supporting the development of digital skills, digital competencies, because pr prior to that, we very much had an IT training team, but it had not necessarily thought about the whole range of skills and competencies that we really want to look at, which we now put under the umbrella term of digital capability. And so we were fortunate um, shortly after we kind of reformulated the team, that we had the opportunity to be involved in the Changing the Learning Landscape project, which was run by, by the Leadership Foundation for Higher Education. And this was um, some years ago now, back around um, 13, 14. And we had the opportunity to work with uh, Miles Nansen and, and Helen Beetham around the work that we wanted to do, which was looking at digital literacy as a, a core competence for both our staff and students. And that really gave us an opportunity to, to really have um, some strategic conversations with um, our university executive team, as it was back then, and um, our broader, both schools and professional services, to have a look at this area and to see really what the key areas that we wanted to come out of it. And so moving forward from that, um, we then became, um, got the opportunity to work on that in a bit more detail. And we were slightly ahead of the broader GISC digital capability um, framework project in that we came up with our own digital framework that to quite detailed level described those skills and competencies that we wanted our staff and um, potentially our students through their courses to be able to have a look at and to articulate within their learning and teaching. Um, where we are now, um, is that we're at a stage where we're now embedding that framework and looking at that in a little bit more detail about how we actually pull that um, support together. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about some of these particular different areas as we move forward. So I mentioned the change in the learning landscape, and that was a really key piece of work for us because it really gave us the impetus to move this piece of work forward. Um, what we found out at the time was that we had probably like most of you, a substantial amount of activity happening, but it wasn't necessarily at that strategic level. Um, and at that stage, we were tending to kind of celebrate our success, but not necessarily shout out about it as much as we do now. 
Um, there was a key opportunity for us to make those literacy skills and competencies clearer for both staff and students, and that was focused at the course level. And that's where the framework that we now have adopted here um, has come from. Um, and this area around support that's available for staff and students, um, that's been a real key and ongoing area. Um, I would not in any way, shape, or form say that we've cracked it. Um, but that's something that we keep working at to try and actually make sure that both staff and students can access the right support at the right time and that it's appropriate for their particular needs. And then alongside that, we obviously want to foster that culture of innovative digital practice so that we can recognize where people are doing some fantastic work in this area, that we can actually give them that, that due recognition. So. We'd actually mapped out our own um, framework, as I said, um, slightly ahead of the work of the GIST Digital Capabilities um, framework, but we've been able to map that quite well. And we had that framework formally adopted um, here at NTU back around autumn 2015. And that was very much and still is very much championed by our Deputy Vice Chancellor, who has the responsibility for academic and learning and teaching. And we see the use of that framework as really pivotal in trying to get digital capabilities um, embedded here at NTU. And one of the appeals of that framework in that it articulates at quite a reasonable level the skills and competencies that we want our, our staff and our students to have is that it provides that common vocabulary that we can have across this institution to try and engage individuals and courses in terms of how they embed digital capabilities within learning and teaching research and for our professional services. So over the last few years, we've been doing some work around trying to embed that framework and to actually put that a little bit more into context. Um, we relaunched our um, what was used to be our postgraduate certificate in higher education as a PG CAP, um, that was in January 2016, and we've embedded the postgraduate certificate, uh, the digital framework throughout that. Um, as we move forward now, I don't know if any of you are involved in this, but obviously we now have the uh, Level 7 Apprenticeship for the um, Academic Professional, and it's really pleasing to see that that has um, recognition of um, our academic apprenticeships needing to develop advanced digital literacy skills. And as we are now working on uh, what that curriculum will look like for our apprenticeships, it really gives us, again, an additional opportunity to make sure that we've got digital capabilities thoroughly embedded through that apprenticeship as well as we have through the, the standard academic practice certificate. What we've also been doing is we've had a work probably similar to lots of you around um, revitalizing our curriculum here at NTU. It's called Curriculum Refresh. And we've had the opportunity to actually look at embedding the digital framework within that. Um, there are certain requirements when courses come to refresh their curriculum. And we actually have a stipulation that courses need to make reference to the key elements of our digital framework within their redesign of their courses. And that's, again, another opportunity for us to make sure that we have those opportunities for the curriculum to reflect the digital capabilities that we want our students to have. And then through discussions with our staff on what they want to do within their um, redesign, what that means in terms of their own digital capabilities. We've looked at it much broader. Um, we've looked at things um, slightly a bit more out of the original learning and teaching context, so things like looking at how we can use it with our, our respect to NTU gender, so that's thinking very much around how we help and support people around managing their digital identity and tying in with some of those broader initiatives that we have here at the NTU. And then obviously where staff have perhaps not necessarily been involved in the curriculum refresh work, but just been trying to look at how they might take this on board for themselves. Uh, and we got um, a, a just case study on this, and I see that the link's there on the slide, but also that Lorraine's posted the link for it. So where are we trying to take that piece of work now? So as we've been in introducing that framework, what's been um, something that's actually come out of that is very much around how we, we get staff in and get them working and 
actually feeling comfortable with the plethora of um, systems and digital capabilities that they need to adopt when they come to NTU. So um, we're just updating our HR system um, this year. So we made a, a tactical decision that we weren't necessarily going to look at um, things like PDCR or appraisals this year because it just wasn't necessarily the right time. But we did notice and we did want to do a piece of work around digital induction. And that's very much around, again, giving people really the right start and trying to make sure that they can actually understand the range of um, systems that they need to get to grips with. Because we've all been there. Um, you try to find out exactly what you need to know within your first week, and there's a whole range of things that you need to get on and deal with. So at the moment, we've been using our framework um, to explore with colleagues from around our professional services and schools what we would want to include, firstly, in a generic core digital induction to try and make sure that everybody has the, the sort of general same footing on that front. And then we're going to be moving into focusing on those who are involved in learning and teaching, our academics who have predominantly research focus, obviously our professional services, and our leadership and management, because digital leadership equally has to be a part of how we actually support our leaders and managers as they go forward with this work. So this is relatively new work. Um, we really just kicked this project off just before Christmas, and it's still in its, its early stages. But it's been a really exciting piece of work, and it's actually really invigorated the whole range of discussions around digital capabilities. And what we've been able to do as part of that is we're part of this next phase of the JISC uh, Digital Capabilities Discovery Tool pilot. And for us, it's about trying to see whether um, it's a useful tool, but particularly, is it useful as part of that digital induction process? And do we find benefit in introducing staff to the ideas and concepts with their around digital capability at that early stage in their induction process. And if we do, whereabouts should it be situated? Should we use that right up front and get people almost, you know, not necessarily day one, but really up front looking at it? Or do we wait till slightly later in that induction process? Where would it be best to bring that in? So that's the work that we're undertaking at the moment in terms of the discovery tool. I mean, more broadly, obviously, we want to try and encourage our staff to use it, but it really gives us an opportunity to actually say, how does that tool fit within that induction piece, and, and does it fit well within that, and how can it help us with this broader area of digital capabilities? Um, so that's where we are at the moment, and that's the types of things that we've been working on here at NTU, and I'm more than happy to take any questions on that front. Yes, um, thank you so much for that, Elaine. Um, yes, yeah, so if you have any questions for either Elaine or Karen, could you please put them in the chat for us on the side, and um, then we can get them to answer um, those questions. Oh, sorry, Lorraine, I think I've just stopped the presentation. That's actually. fine. It's not a problem. I'll start it again. So has anybody got any questions at all? I mean, they're both fine examples of how to, um, you know, embed. In fact, I, I would love it as a template <laughs> for our university um, <clears throat> because we're not as far ahead as, um, these two universities are. Okay, so we have a question here. It says it's for Karen. I'm interested to know how your pilot program worked and a bit more detail. So, Karen, are you there? Hi, yeah, I'm uh, just turning my mic on again. Hi, Alex. Um, the I'm not sure what you mean by the pilot program. I think the pilot program for us was the testing the digital capabilities tool itself and looking about where and look, trying to assess whether or not it was something that we could use uh, as a framework um, to help us identify what were the key digital capabilities that we would then embed within our uh, various uh, our CPD framework initially for, for our academic staff, which was fairly well um, advanced. Um, thank you very much, Lorraine. You're going back to uh, going back to the. Um, I'll go back to the. Yeah. So our, our CPD framework, um, which we had mapped out for academic staff. Um, 
and we looked at whether or not the, the, the GIST is digital capability tool would work for us to identify things which would then be mapped into this framework itself. Um, we did actually try uh, some other tools, but we looked, um, and one of, the, one of the tools that we actually looked at was, was the um, NUS tool um, that the that that we can that's our, our the NUS tool that students are asked to self evaluate or, or use to evaluate how well their course is is um, di capable digitally capable. But Karen, can what, I just stop you then? Just I can just yeah. take over the presentation and then you can just um, move to the slide that you'd like to show. Wonderful. There okay. we go. Yeah. So we had yeah I think. We we looked at we looked at the uh, as I said the NUS tool we looked at the just digital capability tool they were really the only tools we looked at at this stage um, and we thought there's no point in us reinventing a wheel um, and and from our point of view uh, the main job the main difficulty is mapping um, the digital capabilities to the the framework that we have internally. Okay, can I just um, stop you there, Karen, and just say this? Uh, I think it's Lishi um, Solomon. She says, one of the biggest problems we have is getting people on board. I have tried mm. without much success in the past. How did you get senior leadership on board, and what were the selling points? Um, for me, for, in, from University of Hertfordshire's point of view, as I said, we'd had a review of our um, library and computing services. And it was one of the recommendations from that review that we would um, look at digital capabilities strategically in the in the institution, and look at how we would um, develop staff across the institution to to develop their own, or first of all to assess and then develop digital capabilities as part of their entitlement to CPD going forward. So there there was a there was a big it was actually a big push from that review, um, but we. We, the deputy vice chancellor, really sponsored that right from the word go, uh, and saw it as a as a key strategic um, issue for him to to take hold of and, uh, and to drive forward. At the same time, and I think what helped was we were looking at re um, we were looking at replacing our virtual learning environment. So there was there was a technological need, if you like, for certainly academic staff and some professional staff who deal with the, the VLE to um, upskill a little bit because they are they were going to be moving to to use a different platform and so there was a an impetus there to, to get everyone up to speed in using that so a number of things came together I think the the new CPD framework that we were creating uh, the review of, of library and computing services and the the new VLE making that quite a very you know very high level strategic um, way forward for the whole institution. Okay, and, and how about you, Elaine? Could you answer that question? How did you get the people on board, the senior management on board? I think to a certain extent, uh, I started maybe at an ever so slightly lower level initially. Um, that was some of our directors, our director of Centre for Academic Development and Quality, our director of IS system, the, the head of um, organisational development, as, or the equivalent as it was then, to get some momentum around this. And then we were really lucky. Again, it, it's around timing and, and using a particular vehicle sometimes for, for getting things on board. So we had the opportunity to go forward for this change in the learning landscape project. Um, and then at that point, I got the, the Pro-Vice Chancellor for Academic um, on board saying, look, we are all trying to achieve this. This is a real opportunity. And that process actually facilitated the strategic conversation. So the actual process of the um, change in the learning landscape meant that we could get the vice chancellor, deputy vice chancellor, et cetera, into a room. Um, and that was actually facilitated um, by consultants. So it was a real opportunity for us to actually engage and have that senior level conversation. Um, what's been important since then has been about maintaining those links and keeping that engagement going forward. Our Deputy Vice Chancellor has, is very much on board with this. She's very much around, very keen to keep digital innovation and promoting that as part of what NTU's brand. So 
um, I think we've just been out lucky in that we've, in part, we've been pushing an open door on that front. Yeah, um, I can say that at my institution, um, we had a digital champion, which was the director of information services. And so um, he kind of like um, put forward a, a project to the leadership team, which they are going to be taking part in a pilot survey. And we're hoping to sort of like, um, you know, lead down. So it's going to be like top down kind of um, approach. And um, so that was one thing that we had. We had a digital champion. But what I'd like to do is just move on and ask, um, there's, there was a question asked by Alicia Owen, and it was for you, Elaine, and it was mm -hmm. all about the apprenticeship scheme. All right, so I'm scheme. just going to post a link in the chat. Mm -hmm. Is to, um, I think that's come up. Uh, so the government, um, as you know, has the apprenticeship scheme, and one of the standards that they have brought forward is an academic professional. So um, most institutions at the moment, if they've got a PG CAP or a PG CHE, um, I think I think some of them are looking to align that with this particular professional standard. And obviously from a, an institutional point of view, we get charged a certain amount in the apprenticeship level levy and the academic professional is a, a way of us to be, quite frankly, to, to, to claw back some of that money as well. But you actually go and have a look at that um, professional standard and the endpoint assessment that is associated with it, you'll see that it very clearly states um, that um, uh, apprenticeships have to demonstrate an advanced level of digital literacy, which is great from our point of view because that's that hook in and it gives us a real opportunity to really go forward and embed that within it. And I think there was another question around how we've embedded uh, digital capabilities within um, our postgraduate certificate, um, subject to obviously what we're redoing as part of our revalidation for the apprenticeship. It's a bit of both. Um, because we have the framework, we can be quite explicit about the framework itself and actually making sure that that's actually stated up front. But equally, it's something that just threads through. So all the way through, we will be using digital technologies, learning technologies to raise individual students' digital capabilities. But we'll be pointing that out to them as we're going along and doing it as um, part of that. It's also aligned to um, our the UK PSF, uh, the HEA Fellowship, and as you know, as part of that, like it's K4, you have to demonstrate the appreciation and use of learning technologies. So we demonstrate how students can actually demonstrate they can make match that particular element of the HEA Fellowship scheme. Elaine, you've got a, um, Alicia saying that she loves the idea of this curriculum refresh. Okay. All right. So, um, so was this at validation time? Were registry stroke quality involved then? Quality at the school level, yes. Um, it, it will be fair to say there's, as you always find this, it wasn't necessarily there was a particular standard because it wasn't level at that formality of the level of the, the, the revalidation. It was a bit before that, which is around how we're going to re-envisage the curriculum going forward. So the digital framework was one of about seven different elements that staff needed to be able to have a look at. So things like internationalization, employability, I'm sure she'll be able to remember all the others, but there's a whole range of those. And it's that was really positive for us because it was the first time we've actually had an explicit mention of those digital capabilities within the curriculum and actually making sure that staff are referencing that. Okay, that's brilliant. All right, so um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to have to move on now. And um, we have invited um, five people to join us to give their experiences at their um, institutions. And it's all, it's, as you can see, the names are there. You have um, Andrea, Liz, Alicia, Christine, and Sandy. And um, so what we're going to do, we're going to, when you actually booked to come on to this webinar, there were some questions. Some of you filled them in, some of you didn't. These ladies did. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at some of the, um, the answers. So um, first of all, I'd like to um, say hello to Andrea. Andrea, are you there? Hello, yes, I'm here. Okay, wonderful. So Andrea's from the University of um, West England. And um, the first question, it was saying how there was like 72% 
that filled in our digital capability survey, all right, they were questioned embedding staff digital capabilities at work. And what happened is that they said that they produced training for staff as required by their job. And I asked the question, if that happens at your institution, how is it done? Is it done by PDRs? Are they aligned to the business KPIs of your institution? And um, so, um, Andrea, what was your answer? Um, I actually can't quite remember what I wrote, but um, I assume yeah. it's to do with PDR. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't think our PDR system is any different to other institutions. I mean, it's uh, traditionally carried out once a year where individuals look back at their performance um, and gain a range of feedback to review performance, but also looking forward, um, setting objectives in relation to their role and their personal development. So it's really an answer to your question was about, you know, uh, managers do have conversations at that point annually to review what an individual needs in, in relation to be being able to perform their roles. So um, having a conversation about the skills and um, uh, knowledge they need is, is part of that, that process um, of which digital capability comes in. But I have to say, we're not precisely asking them to ask that, that question. So it can be down to the individual's um, own kind of keenness and awareness of their own capability um, in terms of then identifying or their manager identifying what the needs are. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's similar to here. I just wanted to know whether it was enforced. So like the next year, do they go back over the objectives and say, did you carry this out? And if they didn't, yes. is there something, you know, is there um, some encouragement to carry on trying to reach that goal or? You know, oh yeah, I mean we, you know, PDR as we call it is a vital part of, uh, um, you know, motivating and ensuring our, our, our staff feel um, valued as well as kind of in, investing in their kind of training and development. So um, we do have a, a, a KPI around um, PDR completion, although the quality of the PDR discussion, you know, is, is down to the, the manager and the individual. Um, uh, and so, yeah, they're followed up and, they, you know, we do seriously look at that. And they're, within HR, we've just done our own skills audit in relation to digital capability. Um, so, you know, I think in each area, it's becoming much more important to um, have these conversations. And I think we'll get a more central uh, and strategic approach to how we have those conversations but at the moment we're not really there if I'm, if I'm honest. Okay well I'd like to invite Christine. Um, Christine's from Manchester University and um, what's happening at your institution Christine? With regards to enforcing it do you mean? Sorry. Well, well the thing is is that you know um, what we really would want to know is how do you embed the staff digital capabilities into the work all right, okay. and um, and so I know that you mentioned something about some frameworks. Yes, yeah, so we um, worked on the GIST digital fluency framework um, a while ago, the six elements of digital capability, and we made a Lancaster version. And we kind of used that really to have a look at what sessions we were doing through taught one-to-ones or online courses to try and broaden what we offer, because traditionally we went down the route of the, the office applications really. So now we've got a much wider range of sessions available to both staff and students where possible and they're not essential but we're trying to offer them on a regular basis so staff can come to them and we're doing quite a lot more online courses so people that aren't necessarily on campus or can't get to the session at a certain time have still got some learning and support there. So are, we, they, are they linked to the PDRs that you have? Do you have PDRs at your... We, um... we do PDRs very mm. much like Andrew was saying, to be honest. So we don't necessarily reference the digital skills training within them. However, that is something that we will be looking at in the future. But for now, it is very much ad hoc on whether the individual brings it up at the PDR or whether the line manager brings it up. Okay, that's wonderful. Sandy, are you there? Is it possible for you to... Hello. Hello. Um, hi, Sandy. Yeah. Do you want to um, tell us what goes on at your institution as well, please? Um, basically, it, this, it will depend a bit, again, as others have already said, around the PPDR and what is discussed there. Mm -hmm. um, I know that our HR department are trying to take a much more coordinated approach 
and um, what they're doing is they're asking people to indicate what they're looking for in business plans and then they're collating that information and um, looking at anything that has a digital capability link and um, trying to kind of take a more collaborative approach across information services and our, what well, they're called, sorry, they're called student and staff services now, not HR. Um, so that's sort of an element that goes on. Otherwise, I mean, depending on the nature of the, the job that somebody does, I mean, I'm coming from much more of a professional services aspect than a academic aspect. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we tend to work with people, depend, training on the job, um, but we have got a digital capabilities project underway that as it was really encouraging to hear what the two main speakers were talking about because we have got senior buy-in um, and are looking to do something fairly similar with the GISC capabilities framework. So it's good to hear that that seems to be working really well. Oh, thank you so much. I'm just going to get Liz McGregor to um, just um, add to the discussion. So could you just tell us at University of Plymouth what's going on there regarding this? Um, as far as we're concerned, again, it's PDRs, but it's it's difficult to get a central sort of strategic approach to that. We get we it, it, again, it depends on the conversation between the person and the manager, but that isn't centralised anywhere, or it doesn't feed into the wider programme of requirements. They contact us. We have a schedule. Um, um, our team actually works both across academics with teaching and learning and professional services staff. But we have a schedule that we publish um, and people can choose whether they attend or not. Um, what we found quite successful recently is targeting staff. We've had a big deployment of new technology. We had it around Moodle and then recently we've had it with Office 365 and moving to cloud technology. So we that's been really successful in terms of targeting areas to work with. Okay, wonderful. That's lovely. So what we um, going, what we're going to do now is move on to uh, question two, and 50% um, of those that filled in the survey um, said that their institution provided voluntary and freestanding modules on digital capabilities. And so I just wanted to go to Sandy. And um, Sandy, what's happening um, at your institution? Do you offer freestanding and voluntary um, modules? Um, around some things we do. There are some things, particularly around um, sort of cyber security and data protection and the whole idea of digital identity. Mm -hmm. um, are they mandatory kind of? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then otherwise, um, we have some, we have a couple of external consultants who come in and do some um, bespoke training in relation to sort of office based um, um, programs as well. Um, and then as far as sort of access to sort of digital literacy and um, accessing all the resources that will be done depending on the sort of area that owns that um, and there'll be there there's corporate induction where some things are done at corporate induction and then after that there'll be sort of smaller groups or individual one-to-one -one sessions okay and so um, can I get Alicia to answer that question um, remember this is from Glinda uh, University and um, we just want to know whether you have freestanding or voluntary modules on digital capability at your institution. So, did you say Alicia or Liz? Uh, Alicia, sorry. Yeah, okay. That's okay, just <laughs> Am I pronouncing your name wrong? No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'd answered about the fact we've we've got one module now that's only just started and um, this first um, instance of it, we've opened it up to all academic and professional services staff. It's VLE Essentials, yeah. mm -hmm. but in the future, it will be mandatory for new academic staff and any professional services staff who are going to be using the VLE in their job. And that's the only thing really we've got as a, as a complete module. And, and you say that it's credit bearing as well. It is credit bearing, yeah. I'm not quite sure what they can use it towards afterwards, mm -hmm. but um, it, it does tick a few boxes, and it um, 
so far it's going quite well actually i think the main thing is is getting the staff who are using the VLE to see it from the the student point of view because obviously they're students on our course so that's mm-hmm. that's been quite successful but um uh, the big concern for us next is is moving forward the, with the wider digital capabilities agenda it's a key enhancement theme for us for next year and we've been looking at the you know the the just discovery tool um we're not one of the pilot institutions in that we're going to be doing a case study but we've been allowed to use the tool so we're, we're trying to do um, um a case you know a pilot for that now so i guess depending on how well the the VLE module goes, it might be that we start to think about um, something similar for the wider digital capabilities. Okay, thank you. So, um, Christine, can you join the conversation and just let us know what's happening at your institution? Hi, oh, yes. Yeah. So, we have we do have information security is mandatory, mm-hmm. but the, the rest of what we do really is voluntary and freestanding. So, um, we've got like some new starter sessions really called Get Connected, where we run them jointly with our service desk. Mm-hmm. So, for new starters coming in, they're often at a loss, they're a bit overwhelmed on the first week, which is just an hour where we can give them a bit of an overview of what supports available IT services wise but also while they're there they can get the admin rights and get set up with everything that they need mm-hmm. so when they leave the session they're ready to go kind of thing oh, okay. um, so is there um is there a digital skill certificate linked we, yeah so not necessarily to that one in particular so the digital skill certificate has a range of online courses i think we've got about 20 near enough now and those are about an hour long on different elements of the framework really so there's things like the communication there's ones on um, visual impact so we've tried to make it a little bit wider than what we traditionally have um so people can learn different ones like video editing and things like that and the idea is for staff or students they can take part in one of these courses and if they do one from each element of the framework so a minimum of five Mm -hmm. they get a digital skills certificate okay that sounds good that sounds Mm -hmm. good um liz uh could you just let us know what's happening at plymouth yeah, we have a sort of combination of both. But ours is freestanding. Um, staff can choose which courses they come on. There's a few mandatory ones that we have around like site administration, website administration, student records. But generally speaking, they're not mandatory. Um, we also run ones for new starters as well. We run a course for that and, and for an introduction to the DLE for Moodle and e-submission so we get a variety in that respect okay wonderful well can i um, i'm going to ask you the next question okay i think we've only got time for one more and um that was um on the survey 15 percent of you filled in it and said that um, there was a regular digital capability training as part of their cpd all right, so the question was, do all staff have access to the CPD at your institution? And if not, what else is on offer to fill the gap? So some of you have answered, you know, answered this already, um, but do you think that all institutions would benefit from increasing the CPD? When we put this question together, I knew that I never had access to the CPD at my university, but there were other members that said, yes, it's for all staff. So what is the case at your institution? Liz, are you there? Hi, sorry, I didn't realise you meant me then. (laughs) Um, That's okay. Um, Academic staff generally, their sort of culture encourages CPD. It's not quite so much um, around professional services, we find. Um, They they are not always given the opportunity to attend training and and develop their skills. Um, And they tend to, although they can... can, uh, choose to sort of attend the course, they don't always get protected time either to practice the skills or they have to, um, you know, it's it's work commitment so they may have to cancel at short notice be- to cover other people's things. So it's not, it's not part of the norm, if you like, that they can just go on and, and do courses. Um, yeah, I hear what you're has, saying. Yeah. Do you remember, I think it was Karen, 
Karen, was it you that was saying that you're going to use what you've done with the academics as a, a template for the professional service staff? Yeah, is um, and that was. Am I correct? Was it you, Karen, that was saying that? Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd said that. Yeah, we've got we've got our CPD framework for academics, which incorporates the PG cert and everything else, and, and mapping to AGA. But we're going to use that same model, uh, if we can, to try and extend that to all staff, so that they have um, a, a, they have identified ways and routes of of getting the digital capabilities integrated into that first two years with us during during probation and then onwards throughout their CPD yeah, as, they, that, as they go. Sorry, can I just say that we're, we're currently working on a tool to develop that for professional services staff. We've done, we've started a pilot with students and um, teaching staff as well using the JISC to framework, but we've sort of adapted that a bit for professional services so that they get the opportunity to assess their skills and then discuss that with their man managers. Um, and share an action plan and things. So it's it's about raising the profile for professional services staff as well as um, the teaching staff. Um, I'm going to have to um, stop the discussion there. I'd like to say thank you very much to all of you who participated, and I hope that you know those that were listening in actually got some kind of idea about what the community is doing and where they are at. Um, there's lots of discussion going on in the um, the instant chat there. So um, this will be recorded, or is recorded, and it will be put up so that you can have a look um, to see what people have been saying and things like that. Um, I'm just going to quickly um, move on and finish um, finish by just going back to the main slides and just reminding you, if you want to know more, if you want to um, see what other people are actually doing, then we do have a spotlight on digital capabilities number four on the 15th and the 16th of May. And um, there are still spaces there. So go on to the ASIS website and book yourself a place. Um, and if you want to hear more about the people's approaches, then of course tune in to our 16 minutes. Right, and the next one is, as I said before, is going to um, be presented by Ross Parry and Nevin Mondina. And we do have many more that are actually coming up. Um, we just haven't um, publicised them yet. But um, we're going to have quite a few. So um, please keep an eye out for them. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for coming, everyone. And um, we'll see you again next time. Okay, so thank you and goodbye. And can I just thank you, um, Karen and Elaine? Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.